starting to vlog. It's been a few weeks since we've done this. I uh, was a little distracted with the uh, big Venom F5 engine unveiling event that we did out at the Quail Pebble Beach in California a couple weeks ago. So we took a little vlogging break. I really kind of wanted to do some vlogging while we were out there, but there was just too much going on. So anyway, it's Monday morning. I'm driving to the shop and uh, I just wanted to have a quick 20 minute chat with uh, with our followers and I was talking with my daughter Emma earlier about what should we talk about today and she encouraged me to share more about me uh, maybe about some of my uh, failures along the way that some of the things that have kind of shaped me and our company and kind of who we are and what we do and so I thought oh, okay, I can I can go there I can do that and I, I think maybe to kind of try to give context to my background and who I am and what we do and not just about Hennessy performance but what kind of drives the whole passion for performance we'll just go back to the to the very very beginning so um, I was born in 1962 and um, my dad was a car guy and I'm told that when uh, a couple stories about me when I was little uh, my dad had a 64 64 and a half Pontiac GTO tri-power four-speed Muncie four-speed rock crusher transmission. I don't even remember the car, but I'm told that uh, I would go on on uh, anywhere with him in the car and really enjoyed it. So maybe that's one of those things that was just kind of the the sound and the excitement of, of cars was something that was kind of programmed into my into my brain before I can even remember it. So, um, thanks dad for, uh, for, for uh, I guess, planting that seed of, of being a car guy uh, from before I can remember. And um, another story about cars when I was little, um, my mom, I had twin sisters that were brand new babies and I was, I guess, two. And my mom was loading us up in her Volkswagen Bug. And so, the car's parked in the driveway I'm in the car, uh, this is before car seats, so I don't, I'm sure I'm just kind of just, you know, in there, in the driver's seat, wanting to drive. And so she loads up one of the babies in the back, she goes in to get the other baby, and I guess while she was went back in the house, I was able to get it out of gear and turn off the parking brake. So she comes out the door with the other baby in the baby carrier, and she's looking, there's no car. And so when I, like, again, I don't remember this, I was two, when I guess when I got the e-brake off and got it, got it in neutral, the car's parked on a, on a driveway, which is kind of on an incline, and I guess the, the bug rolled across the street, didn't, I didn't hit any cars, rolled all the way to the back of the parking lot, and so she freaked out, come, she finally sees the bug off in the distance, comes running, and uh, she tells me that when she got there, I'm there kind of, pulling on the steering wheel and you know messing around with the with the gear shifter and saying to her mama mama the car goes boom the car goes boom mama so you know John the car guy today building fast cars for for a living um, that's that's kind of where it started uh, and again I don't even remember that that's just stories that my family's told me but uh, as far as cars go I, you know when I was probably in junior high, and I'm still friends with a lot of people I went to junior high with. They're they're still up, up there. Most of them in Kansas City, and might remember some of this stuff. But I remember I was probably in the seventh grade. Uh, was hanging out with some friends, a couple streets down the road. Uh, I know where I was. Rudy Nigro, if you're watching this, I was hanging out for we were hanging out at your house with Paul Tripp and and the gang, and uh, and I, I knew I was supposed to be home. But I was just kind of like, well, we're having a good time, and I'll get home whenever I, I'm ready to get home. And I remember my dad. My dad at that time had a 68, kind of a lime green Pontiac GTO. I remember my dad came over and was not happy that I wasn't home. And uh, he gave me a few words out the window, and I got in the car. And my buddies were kind of standing there like, oh, crap, you're in trouble now. And I remember my dad, as he left, he did a nice, nice burnout. <laughs> I don't think he was trying to put on a show for anybody, but I remember, I just remember him doing a burnout and kind of laying, laying you know, two stripes or 
of rubber with those skinny little 70 series tires. And I remember the next day coming to school, you know, all of my friends and the other kids at school just thought that was so cool. I thought, wow, okay, that's, that's I'll, you know, follow that away, you know, maybe a few years from now when I can get a, get my own car, having something that's fast and cool and sounds good and lays down rubber, sounds like that's a good thing to have. So, fast forward a few years, I, uh, my, let's talk about my first car. So my dad was an insurance adjuster and he would work with people when their cars would get wrecked and he would help coordinate with the body shop to repair the car and so on and so forth. And there was a car that he was, he found from some body shop, I guess they had a client that didn't pay him and so they had a mechanics lien and they had a 1969 Oldsmobile Cutlass 442, um, which was the old version of the muscle car, kind of their their version of the Chevelle, the Chevelle SS. Anyway, uh, 442. When that came out, that stood for four barrel carburetor. I know what I know what a difference between the transmission and carburetor. Four barrel carburetor, four speed transmission, and maybe dual exhaust. Anyway, I'm sure you guys will correct me in the comments. I should know these things about my original car. But anyway, it was a 442, it was automatic, and it was a convertible. And Dad said, hey look, I've got this deal, I'm gonna buy this car, I'm gonna help you with your first car. I guess maybe I'm 14, 15. Let's see, so, but something happened, and my dad bought the car, but then I'm assuming for financial reasons, maybe I had to sell the car. I didn't really I didn't really know. I knew we, we had the car for a couple weeks. Thought it was going to be my car. And the next thing I know, he sells it to the neighbor directly across the street from our house. So not only do I not get the car, but now I have to uh, now I have to look at it in my neighbor's driveway every single day. I was really I just remember being very disappointed. But hey, look, it wasn't my money. It was his money, and I know he his his intentions were good, but uh, it just didn't work out. So no big deal. Um, I always worked as a kid, kind of back up a little bit. Um, my parents always encouraged me to be entrepreneurial, so of course we did the lim you know the lemonade stand deal, and then I remember going to um, Silver Dollar City and going down to Branson when I was a kid, and there, you, the places you could buy lots of fireworks, and I would buy fireworks, and I'd realize, okay, well, my friends back at home, they want to buy fireworks, and I could sell fireworks and make money, so that was kind of cool. And then I also had a, um, when I was in, probably fifth grade through fifth grade through junior high and through my freshman year in high school I would deliver uh, newspapers at St. Joseph's Hospital in Kansas City and that was you know get up at super early in the morning and do that every day and make a couple bucks so the, my folks always encouraged me to be entrepreneurial to make my own money they didn't have very much money growing up I mean we weren't poor but we didn't you know they would pay the bills and we you know we had food to eat but there wasn't a whole lot left over above and beyond that so if I wanted, you know, clothes or, you know, go to, you know, go to eat at a restaurant or whatever that we didn't eat out a whole lot. So I had to, had to make money to do that kind of stuff. So worked at Taco Bell for a while and, and ended up after the newspaper route, I worked at a, at a grocery store, initially just bagging groceries and I could bag groceries with the best of them. So I, I did that again, part-time starting out, I think I was probably a freshman in high school. Um, the, the, the grocery stores in the neighborhood so I could ride my bike there and then kind of rose up from a, from a bagger to a you know, cashier where I could you know uh, they didn't they, you, you didn't have scanning back then you had to look at the label and know what stuff costs and add it all up and collect the money so it was kind of a neat learning experience back to the car deal uh, dad sells the car to the neighbor uh, and then my dad gets into motorcycles he's got this uh, Kawasaki 750 he's tooling around on and and I kind of got into bikes, and I think I just, I was maybe just turning 16, so I'm just getting my license. And so I bought a 100cc Honda that was a street bike, not a dirt bike, and I, I drove that around, but it was like totally slow, and it could barely go like 60 on the highway. So then my dad made me a deal. I bought the, I bought the 750 Kawasaki from him, and that was a lot of fun. And, and Again, if you're a young guy, if you're under 25 and you like motorcycles, I love motorcycles, but just remember, I'm told if you're under 25, your prefrontal cortex of your brain is not fully developed, and so that's the executive function. That's the decision-making part of the brain. 
So if you're into bikes and you're riding bikes and you're under 25, be really careful because my brain thought that I could do things that my, that my, that my body or that my motorcycle couldn't do. So I did lots and lots of stupid stuff on bikes. Got away with most of it, then one day I was uh, had a buddy of mine who was interested in buying a bike, Doug Mueller. Uh, we're gonna go look at a motorcycle with Doug after we're after school. He's riding on the back with me. We're headed over towards his, uh, his house is over in Overland Park. And so we're going down uh, 95th Street. And I, I thought it was a pretty good rider. We're coming up to an intersection and I'm looking at the light, I'm, I'm, I'm observing traffic. Um, the light's green, but then I see like the, like the cars in front of me have like kind of stopped. And so it took me a second to realize the light's green, I can go. But for some reason, the traffic had backed up kind of to the intersection. And by the time I realized, okay, I need to slow down, and I wasn't going that fast, I was probably going 30 miles an hour. When you get to an intersection, uh, riders, again, experienced riders know this, intersections are places where you might have somebody that's sitting there at the light for a few minutes. You know, they're, they're, there's condensation coming out of their air conditioner. If it's, they have older cars, which this is back in 1979, 1980. Um, you know, there's cars that are leaking oil and leaking coolant over time. That the intersections can get real greasy, so that's not you don't have a lot of friction for a serious panic stop, especially on a motorcycle. So I went to hit the brakes, lost control. There's a truck in front of us, laid the bike down on my left side, and we hit the back of the, the bumper of this truck. And I got a hole in my right knee and my buddy Doug broke his uh, fibula and tibula, the lower part of the, the leg, below the knee. Uh, and so here we are holding hands off in the back of the ambulance. Anyway, we're, we're, we both spend the week in the hospital and I kind of start to question, well, you know, I need transportation, I enjoy riding, uh, but, but maybe I need to go back, maybe I need to consider a car. So I, I got back on the horse and, and I rode my Honda 100cc for another several months, rode it in the snow, rode it in the rain. So my neighbor across the street, who was a pretty mechanical guy, he worked at I think Ford had a had an assembly, had a factory there in the Kansas City area. Uh, he was a bike guy, and he offered to help me fix my my crashed um, Kawasaki. And so we kind of went through that process. Really cool guy. I don't know if he's still out there watching this video, but uh, helped me fix my bike. And then um, I said, "Hey, look, I, you know, I, I've always loved that, you know, the old the 442. Um, is there any way we could make a deal where I could trade you my two bikes and some money um, for the 442? So I think I bought the, I think our agreed price on the vehicle was like, I don't know, a thousand bucks. Anyway, we made a deal, and I got the 442. And my junior, senior years of high school." <laughs> had a lot of fun with that car. Did a lot of crazy things, a lot of stuff we won't talk about on the, on the, on the vlog. That was a lot of fun. So kind of fast forwarding from there, just to kind of encourage some folks out there that might be watching this video, getting back to my kind of my daughter Emma's point as far as, you know, what are kind of some of the failures along the way. Well, when I was in high school, I thought I wanted to be an engineer. And so I was pretty good at math and science. Um, but I was I didn't realize at the time. I'm also majorly majorly ADD ADHD kind of the guy that's you know drawing spaceships and airplanes and looking out the window um, Much more than than listen to the teacher, but I could do what I needed to do I could cram for a test and do well and so my grades were okay But I always did really well on tests. So anyway thought I wanted to be an engineer and I remember one time I had, and maybe this is early on in my senior year, I had to go to one of my math teachers for a recommendation for some college application I was putting in. And he uh, he looked at the he looked at the document, looked at me, and with a straight face, he says, oh, engineer, he says, okay, Hennessy, what kind of train do you want to drive? And I'm like, really? I said, do you really think I'm just, I'm only cut out to drive trains, which I would love to drive a train, by the way, to the people that drive trains. That, I think that's an awesome job. But anyway, he kind of meant it in like a way, like there's no way you're ever going to be an engineer, uh, you're not cut out for it. And uh, anyway, so I kind of filed that away and um, went off to went off to college. Did two years, did one year of, of community college in Kansas City, and then I did one year at the University of Missouri in Columbia, uh, Missouri, studying engineering. 
and um, I realized it was tough. And uh, and I just, I, I pr looking back, I probably could have done it, but I just, I ran out of money. Uh, I tried to take, I was trying to take organic chemistry as a freshman, which is just a huge challenge. And so, anyway, I, I probably bit off a little more than I could chew at, at that time. And so, I took a break from from school. And uh, my dad at the time was working in, in Houston. There was a hurricane that had come through, Hurricane Alicia, back in 1983. And he said, hey, look, there's construction work down in Houston. You come down to Houston and get a job, make some money, kind of figure out what you want to do. So I came down and, and did that. And um, I guess the term they use now is a gap year. I was taking a gap year and um, pursued some other entrepreneurial pursuits, had a asbestos removal business back in my early to mid 20s and then I think I've talked about kind of my hobby getting out of control into cars but I, I just again just want to share that hey look if you're out there and um, you're trying college and it's not working for you or people are out there you know kind of telling you well you know maybe you could be an engineer to drive a train but there's no way you're going to be an engineer to do anything else well here I'm living proof that I have at any given time, a half a dozen to a dozen engineers that are that work for me, that that I work with on a daily, weekly basis to design really cool stuff, including our Venom F5. Um, and uh, so, while I don't have the degree, I think that our body of work shows that uh, we've contributed some pretty neat stuff. And we'll talk more at a later date, as far as you know. Again, I've, I've said before, and I'll tell you that for for every one thing that we know that works in terms of High performance cars, there's probably 10 things that, that we've tried that didn't work. And so, um, you know, the I think the saying that's been said before, and it's true, is that uh, failure is not final and failure does not define us. Um, I think, in my experience uh, growing up and through going on 28 years of making fast cars go faster, that, that it's those trials, uh, the, the trials through failure. Um, ultimately you know help me grow and helped our company grow and help us build better cars and so um, anyway so that's a little bit of my background that's a little bit of my story I'm um, getting ready to pull into the shop here in a minute and uh, if you're watching the video I hope we've encouraged you in some way uh, if you have questions you know please feel free to add them to the comments or you know we're on Instagram and Facebook and all that stuff if you want to uh, ask us some questions about uh, me or what we do or you know, I've, been, I've been accused by somebody in the media not long ago of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of shamelessly plugging what we do in these videos I'm like well let's kind of let's you know people have questions about what we do in our business so again I don't want this to be uh, I don't want this blog to be an infomercial I mean if you're if you, if you know if you're interested in what we do you, there, there's a ton of information on our website and our social media but I'd like this to be something that's a little more personal uh, again, about me, about my family. Um, we'll talk more about our family, uh, my wife Hope, and our five kids. We have five kids that are between the ages of uh, our oldest is 24.